Good morning, everyone. It's still not afternoon yet. Uh, so, I'm really, I would like to first thank the organizers and especially Dr. Satya Prabha ma'am for inviting me to share our work with this scientific gathering. And um, we work, my group works, uh, not only with respect to etiology of neurodegenerative diseases or neuronal injury like Parkinson's disease and diabetic neuropathy, but uh, we also look into the repair mechanisms and what are the possible regenerative mechanisms where we can uh, look into to have a solution. So a part of the work only I will be uh, presenting over here and sharing. So there would be references of our earlier work too over here. So uh, my, the talk of the ti the title of the talk is astrocyte-like cells differentiated from dental pulp stem cells protect dopaminergic neurons under six uh, hydroxy dopamine toxicity. So in 1955, after the death of Albert Einstein, the pathologist who was in charge for doing the autopsy stole his brain. But there was a good outcome from it. In 1980, in Berkeley, scientists had discovered that his brain actually had more astrocytes than other human brain samples, which he took as control. So it strongly indicates that astrocytes no longer are the second cousins, and we need to look up into their work. And probably they are not just bystander cells, but they are the cells which are essential to for the specialized neurons to be alive, maintained, and later on favoring or bringing about a regenerative potential. So, uh, Dr. Uh, Nirani, been... if I may just interrupt you. Yes. Can you repeat the last sentence about Albert Einstein's brain? Yeah, the I would. Autopsy. I would. And more <laughs> astrocyte. Yes. Okay. Just repeat it for the benefit of the audience. Yeah. So more in... slowly, let them imbibe it okay soak it more so uh, till now classically the dogma was that astrocytes are just the supportive cells be it structurally be it nutritional providing and uh, that's where they were taken as the second cousins usually for any degenerative diseases or injury the specialized cells were looked into so in 1955 albert Einstein, after passing away of albert einstein the pathologist who was in charge for his autopsy had stolen his brain. In 1980, the Berkeley scientists had discovered that his brain consisted more astrocytes than the controlled samples of human brain. So it strongly indicates that astrocytes definitely do not fall in the category of second cousins of the brain. So they are the cells which we need to look into with respect to etiology of disease and also for repair mechanism. Now, coming, there are several groups which who have established the fact that they, they basically bring about neuroprotection. So their classical role is to provide neuroprotection, be it in physiological condition or under pathological conditions, through neurotropic factors, through secretion of cytokines, then bringing about ionic balance and uh, uptaking glutamate to prevent excitotoxicity and providing even antioxidant substrates like glutathione during the defense mechanism whenever there is an insult in any part of the brain. It also brings about biochemical support and a transport mechanism from the blood to through the endothelial cells into the brain, that's the central nervous system, neuronal cells. So in totality, they have several or multiple functions by which it actually brings about the microenvironment or the niche for any region of brain cells. Now what happens during injury or under degenerative conditions? The one first activity which we get, which gets reported during injury or for any of the neurodegenerative diseases for astrocytes is that they turn from the resting stage to the activated state. Now what happens during activated state? There can be several different mechanisms for different kind of de degenerative diseases. But since my um, 
interest is in Parkinson's disease and uh, uh, amyotropic lateral sclerosis and for the specification of time we have. I would cite few very obvious studies which have got reported where the mutation has been found in the astrocytes like the SOD1 mutation is found in the astrocytes of the amyotropic lateral sclerosis patients for the familial groups and again the genes like Parkin, LRRK2, DJ1, they have been found to regulate the astrocytic functions and these are the genes which are related with respect to Parkinson's disease, be it familial and sporadic. So what does it take? The take home message over here, what we get is that definitely the impairment, be it a transient or a permanent impairment of the astrocytes can lead to neurodegenerative diseases. So the next question comes, so if, if your brain, the microenvironment is becoming inhospitable, so when you're talking about transplantation strategies or cell therapies or any regenerative strategies, it has to be that wherever you're putting in your cell type or wherever you are bringing about a regeneration, the microenvironment has to become hospitable or we should try to design to make it hospitable. So. Obviously, the endogenous astrocytes which are getting affected in the diseases is not the best bet to go ahead with. So now comes the next question that can we design exogenous tissue derived stem cells to mimic the endogenous astrocyte cells. Coming to the candidates of cell based therapies as our previous speaker had already mentioned that the best candidate will be the neural stem cells which reside in the brain. But unfortunately for neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's disease which occurs in the striatum or the midbrain region, there isn't any cues which has been sent to the SVZ region where the NSCs can come and residing NSCs can come and regenerate, be it the astrocytes or be it the neuronal cells. So here the question would be that you have to exogenously transplant the cells over there. So neural stem cells are the best bet because they would provide proper or the, you know, the lineage specific astrocytes and the neuronal cells. But again, it's very improbable or infeasible because of its deep rooted, the, the inaccessibility of it in the deep brain. Now, coming to the neural progenitors, they are the second candidate which can be uh, generated from pluripotent stem cells. But these cells, again, carry the risk of teratoma formation and immune rejection. So again, over here, I would be dealing with the second cousin of the stem cells, which are the adult tissue-derived stem cells. So what are these? These are the mesenchymal stromal cells, which was first discovered in the bone marrow. So the gold standard for mesenchymal stromal cells are still taken as the bone marrow mesenchymal stromal cells. And why are they so special? Okay, having limited multipotency, limited self renewal potential. So why, what is their USP? Yes, indeed, they have homing capacity and paracrine mediators, but the main USP is the immunomodulatory characteristics and non-tumorogenicity. So there have been immense number of experiments carried out worldwide where they have, it, this is definitively proved that how they bring about immunomodulation and they are non-tumorogenic, be it given into physiological condition or under pathological conditions. So the properties means MSCs lack the expression of MHC class two and co-stimulatory molecules, making them hypoimmunogenicity. Then MSCs induce a suppressive local microenvironment through prostaglandins and interleukin 10, and they also express indulamine 2, 3D oxygenase, thus depleting the local milieu of tryptophan. And they prevent T cell responses indirectly through modulation of dendritic cells and directly by uh, disrupting the NK cells and the CD8 and CD4 positive T cells. And as previous uh, speaker, the first two clinical speakers, they have talked about that these mesenchymal stromal cells can be isolated from practically many tissues of the adult system. Now, coming to our cell of choice, we went ahead with dental pulp. That is the adult third molar uh, of adult human beings. Why so? 
This is mainly because they are of cranial crest, neural crest origin. And now increasing studies are stating that the organogenesis studies are stating that the contribution of embryonic ectomism kind, the ectodermal epithelial, even the peripheral nerve associated glial origin of the dental pulp stem cells. Besides this, the anatomical significance, like unlike the olfactory uh, neural crest cells, these are anatomically isolated from the fibroblasts. So they, they are quite pure when you are isolating them. And they share the same immunological properties and mesenchymal properties like the bone marrow stromal cells. And uh, the last to mention that obviously lesser fewer ethical concerns are present with respect to these. Now, the neural plasticity, I've been working on it for adult tissue derived stem cells starting from bone marrow mesenchymal stromal cells, then Wharton's jelly stromal cells, and we had shown that the best capacity of or the plasticity towards dopaminergic neurons was being from the dental pulp stem cells, and we had also shown the mechanism why they are better bets. So not only the in vitro work, there are further in vivo work, corres so corresponding in vivo work had come out where they had shown the ability or the plasticity of the dental pulp stem cells to go towards mature neuronal or dopaminergic neuronal cell type, thus establishing that definitely they have a neuronal plasticity towards uh, specialized neuronal cells. Now comes the question that whether they would be efficient enough to form the non-neuronal supportive cell type and which would then be a good bet for bringing about uh, hospitable uh, supportive cells during these degenerative conditions. So we went ahead, hence our aim was to evaluate the differentiation potential of dental pulp stem cells to astrocyte-like cells. And we wanted to validate that whether there is any difference between the naive dental pulp stem cells and the differentiated cells with respect to neuroprotection of the dopaminergic neurons under toxicity, the 6-hydroxy dopamine toxicity, which is the classically the toxin for Parkinson's disease. So this evidence obviously would lead to uh, cues or definitive mechanism will be unrevealed where we can be using it for neurorescue role of supportive cells and identifying with the adult tissue source for this kind of work. So when we uh, isolated the DPSCs, these before we start out any work, we, as per the International Society for Cellular Therapy, we have to look into the immunophenotyping with respect to the population of mesenchymal stromal marker expression and HLA-DR expression. These were functionally being differentiated to osteocytes and to adbocytes to look into their mesenchyme-like property, whether they cater to that, and indeed they, the experiments showed that they are able to differentiate to osteoblasts and to adipocytes. And the PCR uh, work showed the differentiation markers been coming up after, dif after differentiation. Then we induced them through two phases. One first was the pre-induction in which we had to take out the serum, that's your fetal bovine serum, because any of the differentiation protocols is best accepted if you use chemically defined um, and cytokines or cues, because it should not be, um, it should be robust and reproducible rather than being undefined. So the first pre-treatment goes for with respect to EGF and FGF. After the third day, we bring about the glial factors like neuroregulin, PDGF, and dibutyryl cyclic AMP. So as we can see that there is distinct morphological changes which starts out from day three onwards, and the complex stellar morphology starts out from day six and day nine. And at these three time points, we went ahead to characterize these cells using facts, that's flow cytometric detection of the expression of the glial markers like GFAP, EAT2, and S100 beta. Parallelly, we went ahead to check whether the neural progenitor marker or early neural progenitor marker like ACL1 and neural crest marker, they are uh, down-regulated or not. So 
again, these are the qualitative experiments through immunofluorescence showing the expression of these uh, glial markers, GFFPS100 beta and EAT2. And at the same time, we, were, it, we wanted to know whether when it is bringing about a signature of glial cell type, whether it is still maintaining and expressing its mesenchymal immunophenotypic, those CD markers. So we went ahead to see that. And indeed, there was a reduction in the mesenchymal marker. And there was an, still 45% of the population was, was expressing the neural progenitor marker, Nestin. Nonetheless, an important finding over here was they were still not expressing the CD80, that's the co-stimulatory marker, and HLADR. So suggesting they, they shouldn't go ahead for immune rejection. Now, usually astrocytes' main function, as I had cited, is being its ability to secrete neurotropic factors. And in our previous study, we had shown that region-specific, of a specific density, region-specific astrocytes are crucial for the survival of dopaminergic neurons when they are undergoing 6-OHT toxicity, and BDNF being the crucial factor for its survival. So here too, we went ahead to check few of the crucial neurotropic factor which are secreted by the DPSCs and whether we find a change when they are put under astrocyte induction. So indeed, we found um, that th there was an increase in GDNF, BEGF, BDNF and HEF. The NGF was reduced the expression. So what we found was that these astrocyte induced DPSCs showed distinct increase in neurotropic factors and they were the non-NGF type expressing astrocytes. So the, here comes our work plan where we went ahead to validate now that what you've got, your naive DPSCs, your differentiated DPSCs, whether there is any difference and what is the mechanism, how we find it out between these two cell types to bring about neuroprotection. So we adopted two modules. One is the direct cell-cell contact. So over here, we wanted to know whether there is immediate effect in survival or not. So over here, we used homogeneous cell type, that's a secondary cell line, SHSY by Y cells, which are used widely for dopaminergic functions and dopaminergic cell type to validate any drug or any treatment. So we had, we had label the cells with PKH26 and seed it onto DPSCs and astrocyte-induced DPSCs. Then after the 6-OHDA treatment, we went ahead to check after 48 hours what is the yield of PKH26 through flow cytometry. That so PKH26, what does it do? It goes, it's a cell tracker dye and they would be retained only in the live cells. So once the cells die, due to apoptosis or necrosis, the cell won't be expressing this dye. This dye won't show fluorescence. So it's an in immediate indicator about the survival or yield of the cells under the toxicity and again, when they are being seeded onto DPSCs and differentiated DPSCs. And the next module which we started out was with the non-contact culture system where we use transwell inserts to go ahead for looking into the protective action. And here we had used primary culture from embryonic rat midbrain. Why so? Because embryonic rat midbrain cells, they express, so we had already established this culture where we had seen the neuron glia ratio, which is present exactly in the adult rat midbrain. So we had totally characterized, quantified the expression of the TH expressing cells. Not only that, their expression of the, the uh, crucial transcription factors like NGRIL1, NUR1, PITX3, and even the vesicular synaptic vesicle marker VMAT2 and the dopamine transporter. Hence, we went ahead to take, take these cell type and they were seeded always onto the well plate. And the DPSCs, be it in the knife form or in the differentiated form, were plated onto the inserts. So this parameter was being done throughout the experiments, which I will be talking now. 
So for the contact culture system, we found that definitively when there was 6-OHD treatment, there was distinct decrease in cell survival with the presence of the DPSCs, the naive DPSCs and the differentiated DPSCs, there was definitive increase in survival and the detection of PKH26 labeled SHSY cells and hence we understood that there was a protective action of the DPSCs under toxicity. In, on top of that, we found that there was a significant difference in the survival of the SH cells when the feeder cells were the differentiated DPSCs. So we went ahead with the indirect non-contact method because we wanted to pinpoint what are the secretory factors and what is the diffusible factor which might be bringing about this interaction. So for so we had went ahead to check finally over here too under induction and in the presence of the feeders be the knife DPSCs or the differentiated DPSCs the specific population. So over here we have a mixed culture so they would be expressing astrocyte marker like GFAP, they would be expressing mature neuronal cell marker the beta tubulin 3 and the dopaminergic neuronal marker tyrosine hydroxylase. What we found distinctly was that in the presence of knife DPSCs and in the presence of differentiated DPSCs, there was definitively an increase in survival of the mature neuronal cells, and which was not much significantly different between the two feeder types. So basically the knife DPSCs and differentiated DPSCs had similar effect of survival on mature neurons. Coming to the tyrosine hydroxylase expressing neurons, here is where the difference was observed that where a significant increase or yield of TH neurons was found when even under 6-OH detoxicity when they were we had provided the feeder as the differentiated DPSCs. So basically the data indicated that significant ability of astrocytes differentiated from DPSCs to protect the neurons regardless of contact and non-contact method and it was better for the differentiated DPSCs. So as I said that the innate ability of any supportive cells when we are looking for in the brain is the secretion of neurotropic factors. Here we had isolated the factor for BDNF because we had seen that it plays a major role for the survival of dopaminergic neurons. So we went ahead to look into whether indeed this deep BDNF is playing a role here too for the neuroprotection. So we used for both when in the inserts when we had put the DPSCs, the knife DPSCs and the astrocyte differentiated DPSCs, we exposed them to the blocker of BDNF receptor that is the TRKB receptor blocker ANA12 and went ahead to check the assess the population of mature neuronal cells, GFFP and the dopaminergic neuronal cells through flow cytometry. What we found was that there was whatever recovery what we had seen in the presence of the feeder, we had seen that again a significant impairment happened in the survival of the TH neurons and the mature neuronal cells. So this definitively and immediately indicated that BDNF is playing a major role in bringing about this neuroprotection which is being secreted by the feeder cells. Now, the next question was that does this feeder cells constitutively whatever they release is good enough or is it that there is a specific crosstalk coming in because whenever we are the even be it in the physiological conditions the constitutive release and the stimulated release under certain insult or under st certain uh, stimulation is very different and that has to be spe specifically defined when you're talking with respect to a pathological condition. So uh, there have been several reports where it has been shown that nitric oxide, a diffusible factor which gets released during 6-hydroxydopamine toxicity brings about the expression or increases the expression of BDNF in astrocytes. And in our earlier work too, we had shown that indeed NO-mediated BDNF release in astrocytes 
were the crucial factor in mediating neuroprotection. So we went ahead to look into whether here too the mediator or the interaction between the feeder and the dopaminergic neurons under stress is through nitric oxide or not or is it just the constitutive release of BDNF was enough and whether there is a difference between the knife cells and the differentiated cells. So first uh, we, so here we use the blocker for uh, nitric oxide synthesis, which is L-name, and uh, there was two sets of experiments for each of them. So over here, first we blocked the secretion of NO from the midbrain dopaminergic neuronal cells, which are the cells which we are looking for, the protection of whose we are looking for. Dr. Now coming to the. If you could uh, just summarize, please. Yeah, yeah, I will. A few minutes. Uh, so we put the feeder, again we had used the blocker in the total cells. So what we found from the, uh, the take home message from this experiment was that definitely the nitrite release from the differentiated DPSCs was far higher than the knife DPSCs. So now, will this, was this translated again to BDNF? So we found that under toxicity, the differentiated DPSCs expressed or secreted more amount of BDNF. So next, our experiment with L-name, as parallelly we had checked for the nitrite secretion, we went ahead to check the BDNF secretion. Here too what we found that when it was naive DPSCs, the, incre the decrease in the BDNF under the L-name treatment, that is when the nitric oxide is blocked, is not much significant between the two, between DPSCs and the midbrain. Whereas, when it was the differentiated DPSCs, when they were blocked, there was a definitive decrease in the BDNF secretion. Thus suggesting that the differentiated DPSCs are capable of a BDNF release, both through an autocrine and a paracrine mediated method, NO being the mediator over there, the diffusible mediator. So basically our data suggested that the DPSCs exposed to astrocytes like Qs, which are present during ontogenesis, are definitely capable or shows the plasticity towards astrocyte-like cells, and they definitely are a better candidate in bringing about neuroprotection of dopaminergic neurons when they are put under stress like 6-hydroxydopamine. So this leads to the fact that whether these cells can be tested in preclinical model. So I would like to acknowledge uh, DBT. This was from the IYBA grant from Department of Biotechnology. ICMR, Nimhans, and uh, my students, Kavina being the main person, uh, the, my first student who had worked on it. And thank you for your patience. <laughs>